Linda Chen, a 32-year-old Swedish woman, went missing without a trace in the summer of 2009. This is one of the strangest unsolved crimes in Sweden. Every year, about 250,000 people go missing in Sweden, and Linda's loss adds to that scary number. Even though law enforcement and the community have tried very hard, they still do not know what happened to Linda Chen. Hi and welcome back to our channel. If you are new here, please consider subscribing, as it helps us motivate to create more intriguing content for you. Let's have a look at the case of Linda Chen. In 1977, Linda Chen was born in China. She was 15 years old when she went to Sweden. While waiting for her family in a refugee center, Linda formed a close bond with Ida Johansson. Ida became like a mother to Linda. People knew that Linda cared a lot about clothes and music. She was proud of her appearance and liked to do things like singing karaoke. As an adult, Linda had a few relationships that did not work out, and one of them led to the birth of her son. Unfortunately, her first partner beat her up so badly that he was accused of trying to kill her. Linda married twice more, but neither marriage lasted. Linda started meeting Matsalm, a man she met on an online dating site, in the spring of 2008. They were engaged soon after their first date, and their relationship moved quickly from there. Linda helped Mats with money by giving him money to help pay his bills and even pay for their wedding. She also gave her son a trust fund. Mats was in charge of the money in the fund until he turned 18. On August 5, 2009, Linda Chen went missing in Fallon. Her last known location gives a look into what happened before she went missing. Linda was a waitress, and she had just finished her shift. When she got home, she told her partner, Mats, that she was going to meet a friend later that night. They had no idea that this was the last time they would ever see each other. Linda and Mats chose to go shopping at a nearby store before Linda left her apartment. The store's security cameras caught this trip, so there is proof that Linda was there at that time. It is a key piece of evidence in the case because it gives a clear timeline of what she did before she went missing. After going shopping, Linda and Mats got in their car and drove for about two and a half hours. Their goal was to find places that Linda's family could visit while they were there for their wedding. This drive shows how much the couple is looking forward to and excited about the upcoming party. It also shows how much they want their loved ones to have a great time. When Linda and Mats got home, they savored their time together over a meal and enjoyed being with each other. After dinner, Linda started getting ready for her night out, probably because she was excited to meet her friend as planned. The details about this friend and why they met are still unknown, which leaves a hole in the story of Linda's last hours. At 9 p.m., Linda said goodbye to Mats and left her flat. They had no idea that it would be the last time they would see each other. The reasons why Linda left and why she ran into her friend afterward are still a mystery because no other sightings or proof have come to light. When no witnesses could back up Matt's story about what happened to Linda after she left their apartment, the cops started to get suspicious. No one could say for sure that they saw the couple come home from the store or that they saw Linda leave her house at 9 p.m. This difference in what witnesses said made Linda's disappearance even more mysterious. Matt's claim that Linda did not change her clothes before going out seemed strange to Linda's family, since she usually liked to get dressed up for social events. Linda was very interested in fashion, so her friends and family found it strange that she did not care as much about how she looked the night she disappeared. These differences added to the rumors and made it hard to believe Matt's story. Investigators and Linda's family members doubted Matt's statements asking if he was hiding important information or could have been involved in her disappearance. As the investigation went on, the cops looked for more clues and proof to find out what happened to Linda. The focus shifted to finding out more about Matt's past, relationships, and possible reasons, trying to find any clues that could help figure out what happened to Linda. The police also worked harder to find possible witnesses who might have seen Linda or talked to her the night she disappeared. Even with all of their hard work, they could not figure out what was going on. 
Linda Chen's disappearance is still one of Sweden's biggest mysteries, and her family and friends are eager for answers and justice. As the cops looked into the case, they became sure that Mats had something to do with it. No one saw the couple come home from shopping, and no one saw them on their long drive either. There were differences between what Mats said and what the records at their wedding reception place said, which made the puzzle even bigger. Even though many people tried to find Linda, no one knew where she was or what had happened to her. Even though Linda's case was still open, strange things kept happening in Matt's arm, which added to the mystery and gave detectives more questions. As word got out about Matt's suicide attempt, people began to wonder if there was a link between his actions and Linda's absence. Matt's desperate act happened on the same day he was supposed to meet with the cops. This made people suspicious and raised eyebrows. Investigators looked into his mental health to try to figure out if there was a link between his attempt to kill himself and Linda's disappearance. Did Matt's feel too guilty, or was he keeping a dark secret that drove him to the edge? While Matt's was still in very bad shape at the hospital, the police were in a tough spot. They thought about the chance that Matt's attempt to kill himself was not just a sign of his own sadness, but also a way for him to hide his involvement in Linda's mysterious case. The cops carefully looked at what happened before Matt's suicide attempt to find any clues that could help them figure out what happened to Linda. They talked to people he knew, looked at how he had behaved in the past, and looked for signs of wrongdoing. But no matter how hard they tried, they could not find anything. Matt's critical state made it hard to question him right away or find out what he knew. Together, the unanswered questions about his suicide attempt and Linda's disappearance made a web of mystery and confusion that continued to confuse both the police and the public. Matt said that he could not remember what happened before Linda went missing while he was getting better. He said he was not guilty and had nothing to do with her disappearing. But since there was no hard evidence or leads that led to other possible suspects, the investigation stayed focused on Matt's. People in the community started to think that Matz was the main candidate because of rumors and speculation. People looked even closer because of online talks and news stories, which made them angry and want justice. People held vigils and rallies in Linda's name to ask the authorities to solve the case and bring peace to her family. Even though the investigation was getting hotter, it did not lead anywhere. The cops had a hard time making real progress because they did not have any physical proof, witnesses, or good leads. Linda Chen seems to have vanished into thin air, leaving detectives and the general public with no idea what happened. The media stopped talking about the case as much as they used to over the years, but Linda's family, friends, and people who are interested in unsolved mysteries never forgot about it. Because no one knew why she had gone missing, the community continued to feel a deep sense of loss and anger. One of Sweden's most strange and puzzling cold cases is still the disappearance of Linda Chen. Even though there have been a lot of studies, nobody knows where Linda is or why she vanished. The story became even more intriguing when it was revealed that Linda's former fiancé, Mats Alm, was a suspect. But there is no real evidence that he had anything to do with Linda Chen's disappearance, and his attempt to kill himself erased any possible memories. This makes it hard to find out what happened to her. As time goes on, people still want to know what happened to Linda and for the case to stop. It serves as a reminder of the many unsolved secrets that continue to haunt communities around the world and the long-lasting effects they have on the lives of the people left behind. How do you feel about this case? Let me know in the comment section below. A terrible thing happened two days before Jerry Martin turned four. On July 9, 1945, a strange woman came up to Jerry and his six-year-old brother Tom and tried to take Jerry with her. The boy had been missing for years, and his family finally accepted that the worst had happened. But after 74 years, a shocking secret came out from a place no one expected it to come from. How did this information get out after so long? Why have 74 years gone by? Today's case takes us to Manhattan, which is the most populated of New York City's five areas. The Hudson, the East, 
and the Harlem rivers all circle Manhattan Island, which is where most people live. It is the hub of the Big Apple, which is one of the most important places in the world for business, finance, and culture. The Empire State Building, Times Square, and Broadway are some of its most famous landmarks. People say that Manhattan is the cultural, financial, media, and entertainment center of the world. It is also where the United Nations is located. Most art sales happen in art galleries and auction houses in Manhattan. The foreign art market is also in Manhattan. On July 9, 1945, Tom and Jerry were riding their bikes near their home in Manhattan. It was a hot day. A strange woman came up to them as they were riding their bikes and gave them some candy. Tom was not sure, so he said no. His younger brother Jerry, on the other hand, could not say no to the treat and took it right away. The woman then took Jerry's hand and told Tom that they would be back soon. But as time passed, neither the woman nor Jerry came. Tom got scared and ran to tell his parents that someone had taken his little brother. Their parents were getting more and more worried, so they called the cops and started a mad search for their missing son. No one could find Jerry, no matter how hard they tried. Tom and his family had no idea what happened to him for the rest of their lives. It is hard to think how painful it would be to lose a child in such a shocking way. And this tragedy will change the Martin family for the rest of their lives. Tom and Jerry Martin's parents, Harold and Nancy Martin, raised them. Jerry's disappearance was sad because the couple had already broken up. This left Jerry's family broken and upset. Harold had remarried and had a girl named Mary who was a year old. This made things even more confusing and made people wonder where Jerry had gone. Police thought that one of the parents might have taken the boy because they were fighting. Even though Jerry had gone missing, Nancy said she had nothing to do with it and was innocent. Her family was always there for her and never doubted what she said. But as time went on, no one knew what happened to Jerry, and his family had to pick up the pieces and move on with their lives. As the months turned into years, they realized that Jerry had been missing for decades. The Martin family never gave up hope that their son and brother would come back to them. But as time passed, that hope began to fade. Harold and Nancy have both died, so it is now up to their son Tom to keep looking for Jerry. Tom did everything he could to find out what happened to his brother who had been missing for a long time. In the 2000s, when DNA testing became possible, he sent in his DNA so that his family could have it checked. He hoped the results would help him find Jerry. Even though they had been looking for so long, Tom never gave up hope. If there was a chance Jerry was still out there, he knew he had to keep looking. The Martin family story is one of sadness and strength. No parent should have to deal with the loss of a child, and it is a sadness that Jerry's disappearance is still a mystery after all these years. Still, Tom's never-ending efforts to find his brother showed how much people care about each other and how strong the human spirit is. No one thought that something big would happen in 2007, but it did. Audrey Bell, a triplet mom from Long Island who is 51 years old, bought a 23andMe testing kit online in 2017 to find out which of her triplets were identical and which were related. Bell was surprised to find out from the 23andMe DNA test that she was not Italian as her parents had always told her. Instead, the test showed that her DNA came from Ireland, Scotland, and Spain. Audrey did not get it, especially since her father, Richard Palmadeso, had always been proud of his Italian roots. Audrey asked her parents about the findings, but they were just as confused as she was, so she decided to move on with her life. Audrey had always heard that her family was from Southern Europe, but the records did not say anything about Italy. Belle grew up in New York in a strong Italian-American home. Palmodesso was her first name. She had never even considered the possibility that she was not Italian. They thought the computer had made a mistake and went on with their lives. In 2019, two years after their initial inquiry, Palmodesso did not pose any further questions to 23andM or conduct any additional research. When Audrey's twin sister Cynthia McFadden and their younger sister Stephanie Palmadeso took their own DNA family tests, they were shocked to find that neither of them had any Italian roots. To clear up any confusion about why Cynthia and Audrey have different last names, they are twins who married guys with different last names. Two years after the event, 
when her sister Cynthia sent 23 Anmim a sample of her DNA in 2019. The story came up again. Again, the answers she got were not what she expected. The facts also showed that Cynthia was not Italian. At this point, their father had been dead for two years, so it was hard for them to figure out what was going on. So they went to the next person they thought might know something. Most of the test findings about their cousin Richard Palmadeso, whose name was the same as their father's, surprised them. Richard told Cynthia and Audrey that even though they knew each other, the rest of the Palmadeso family had nothing to do with them. Cynthia, unlike Audrey, decided to let 23 Anma look in their database to see if she had any genetic cousins. This means that 23 Anmi would show her if they had any other DNA information that matched hers in their database. She was surprised when a man named Tom Martin came up as a match for her. He was either the boy's grandfather or uncle, because he shared 22% of their DNA. Still, this was strange because none of the Palmodesos had ever talked to Tom Martin. He was 79 years old, retired for a while, and living in Florida at the time. People say that he used his own DNA to find out who took his brother Jerry, which turned out to be the key. Later, they decided to talk to Tom in person by using 23 Andon to get in touch with him. On July 9, 1945, when Tom was six years old and Jerry was only two days away from turning four, Tom informed Cynthia and Audrey that his younger brother Jerry had been taken away. At that moment, Jerry was on the verge of reaching the age of four in just two days. Tom spent decades looking for his lost brother. To help him find him, he made a DNA profile. Cynthia and Audrey started to wonder if their father, whom they had always called Richard Palmadeso, might actually be Jerry Martin. In the United States back then, strangers rarely took children from their homes. In 2019, strangers only took children in about 1% of the cases that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children worked on. But it is hard to know how often people were taken and what happened to them before the 1980s. The Missing Children Assistance Act and the National Registry for Missing Children did not start until 1983. During the first part of the 20th century, Babies and young children were often taken away from their homes. Most of the time, this was done for illegal adoptions. But sometimes women who wanted children but could not have them did it too. Even if there had been a national database at the time, it would have been hard to count these cases because families might not have known about the kidnappings until a long time later, if they knew at all. Because there was no way to test DNA, Families may have raised children who were not their own because of a mistake in the hospital or a kidnapping to hide the truth. In the first half of the 20th century, women who could not have children but felt pressure from society or their partners to do so were the most common kidnappers. Audrey asked her police officer brother-in-law to look into the cold case because she thought Jerry Martin could be Richard. But the file might have been lost in a fire at the station, the family was told. This piece of information, which came from the New York Daily News, was one of the few things the twins found that gave them more information about the theft. As they found out more about Tom, they found more signs and parallels that supported the DNA results. The twins saw that Tom and Richard looked a lot like each other when they looked at their pictures. When they finally met Tom in 2019, they found out that they had even more things in common. They were shocked to learn that Tom liked coconut cake, movies, and acting just like their dad. Tom also had some old pictures of himself that showed he was interested in acting when he was younger. Even though everything seemed fine, it was not clear if Richard was really Jerry. Did the Palmodiso realize he had been taken? How long had each person known what they knew, and what did they know? On May 31, 1943, Isabel and Angelo Palmodiso recorded on Richard Palmodiso's birth certificate that he was born in Staten Island. Isabel and Angelo had never had a child before he was born. But Isabel, who was in her 40s, already had two grown children from a previous relationship. Both of them were in their 20s. Isabel was in her 40s, and she and Angelo had never had a child. She had two grown children from a previous relationship. But she was desperate to have a child with Angelo before he came back from the war. People say that she grabbed Jerry in June and brought him to their house. Isabel told Jerry that his new name is Richard, and that he is only two years old, not four. She changed his birth certificate, 
so it said he was born in 1943. Even though this was shocking to Richard Palmadeso's sisters, his cousin Tom Martin did not think it was anything out of the ordinary when they told him. He said that their father, Richard, was the only Palmodiso who did not know that their father was not connected by blood. He said that everyone else in the family knew what was going on. Richard told the girls that when their father was a kid, Isabel made fun of him and would not let him talk at the dinner table. So their father got worried, and he carried that worry into adulthood. No one in his family tried to keep in touch, not even Angelo, who died when their father was only 26 years old. When he finished school and moved away, Richard's daughters thought that Angelo's wife, Isabel, might have gotten pregnant right before he left for World War II and either lost the baby or lied to Angelo about it. As Angelo's return became more likely after the Nazis gave up, people started to wonder if Isabel took Jerry because she felt she had to give Angelo a two-year-old son. The sisters thought that Isabel might have taken a child and raised it as her own, but they could not prove it. This idea says that Isabel's actions were not like those of other women who steal kids to make their husbands think they are theirs. Even stranger was how Jerry would have been explained, especially if he had been taken right to the Palmodesos house after being taken. He would have been given a new name and new parents, and he would have been told that he was now two years old, not four. Tom, his wife Mary, Audrey, and Cynthia talked to each other, a lot on the phone, on Facebook, and through text messages. The sisters talk about their father and how much they miss him when Tom and Mary have big events today. As a way to stay in touch, Mary gave Tom framed pictures of the sisters' trip to Florida earlier this year. On Father's Day, she gave them to him because he had never had any of his own. Even so, Audrey and Cynthia are sad to hear that their father was taken because he no longer has boys with whom he could have grown close. Even though they still do not know a lot about their father, the women know more about him now that they know how he was taken away. They remember that he was kind, funny, and fun, but also that he had bipolar disorder and was always worried. The twins could never understand the distance between him and his family. Now we understand why most of Richard's family in Palmadesso had lost touch with him and had not done much or anything to get to know his wife and kids. Audrey says it seems like Tom has found peace too. She tells him that he is sad that they could not find each other in time to meet again. But he is glad to hear that her father had a family who loved and cared for him. She also says that Tom is sure that her dad is now back with his real parents. On the evening of July 1, 2020, someone abducted Lydia Anda Beltran from her home in the city of Culiacan, Mexico. Despite the relentless search for answers, her tragic end was confirmed with the discovery of a burned body. The legal proceedings that followed led to the sentencing of those involved shedding light on the horrifying details of her kidnapping and murder. Yet the quest for justice is far from over as questions linger about the involvement of three other individuals. The police began their investigation the next day and were able to solve one of the worst killings in Mexico. Culiacan, located in the heart of Sinaloa, is a city that tells a tale of contrasts and complexities. Nestled in the fertile Culiacan Valley, the region serves as a vital agricultural hub, often referred to as the breadbasket of Mexico. Its soil gives life to a cornucopia of crops, from luscious tomatoes to golden fields of corn, sustaining the nation's food supply and local economy. However, Culiacan's story is not solely defined by agriculture. The city carries with it a deep cultural heritage, boasting museums and cultural events that reflect its rich history. The Sinaloa Art Museum houses a treasure trove of contemporary Mexican art, while the annual Carnival of Mazatlan brings the city alive with music, dance, and vibrant parades. Yet Culiacan also grapples with its connection to the drug trade. It's the birthplace of the notorious Sinaloa cartel, and the shadow of narco culture looms large. Narco corridos glorify drug lords, highlighting the complex relationship between the cartels and the local population, which has been marked by violence and security challenges. Despite these challenges, Culiacan is not merely a backdrop for drug-related stories. It's a dynamic city with a growing industrial sector, bustling markets, and a commitment to education and innovation. Back to the story. Lydia Anda Beltran was the middle child of three and lived in this city in northwest Mexico, 
her whole childhood and teen years. Lydia spent most of her time with her grandmother Andrea in the loop of Victoria neighborhood. She did not see her mother Maria Vivian very often because she lived with her husband in Costa Rica. Just like many other 18-year-olds, Lydia enjoyed spending time with friends, going to parties, and simply hanging out. She was friendly and well-liked, and she had a lot of friends. Besides that, the way she looked caught people's attention. Lydia was 5 feet 7 inches tall, had dark hair that was long, and light brown eyes. Lydia's uncle thought that Lydia and her friends liked to party, which he thought was normal for young people. Linda met Paula Narita Medina at one of these events. Paula was a nurse and had an older sister named Alina Milagros Medina. She also talked to a Randy Menners, who was a mother of two young children. At least that is how it seemed. They hit it off right away with these girls and became good friends very quickly. Lydia had no idea that her life would change so much when she met them. She went out to have fun on the evening of June 30, 2020. She first went to a small party with Paula and Randy. Lydia and her friends chose to take a ride in the car of a friend of Paula and Randy after the party. They went to many places, including a well-known lookout point. In the end, they chose to go to the house of Kelly Michelle Ibarra, a girl underage who was known to everyone in the group. Kelly asked them to stay the night, which matches what Lydia's uncle reportedly said. He said Lydia told her family she was going to a friend's house to spend the night. The girls said that they had a great time that night talking, watching movies, and then going to their rooms to sleep. On July 1, 2020, Lydia and Itzel received multiple calls from Kelly who informed them that her house had been broken into and some jewelry was taken. The girls said they did not know anything about it because they were already at home. They still chose to ask their friends. They also said they would let Kelly know if they learned anything. Following the event, Kelly told Paula what had occurred and Paula created a strategy to assist her friend in recovering the lost items. Some news sources say that the nurse told her that she knew people who could use violence to get the thief to confess. Around 6.30 that night, Lydia was with her grandma at home when the doorbell rang. When she opened the door, she saw Kelly and Paula who looked very upset. They asked her again about the jewelry in a mean way. They were so persistent that Lydia, who was already feeling tense, pointed the finger at Itzel as the person who stole the things. After that, Paula and Kelly forced Lydia to go to Itzel's house with them to settle the issue. Randy drove a gray Toyota Corolla with Lydia's two kids and Paula's sister Alina. Things got much more tense when they got to Itzel's house, which is not far from Boulevard Nichols Bravo. Paula and Kelly hit Lydia in the face and demanded that she give them back the stolen gold, even though Itzel kept saying she had nothing to do with it. The girls would not believe her, so they kept questioning her in a meaner way. In the middle of all this chaos, Lydia broke down. She could not stand seeing how badly they were treating her friends, so she admitted to stealing the things they took and said they were at her house. Again, Paula and Kelly pushed Lydia into the car and drove her to her grandmother's house. The two girls told Lydia that if she wasted their time, they would hit her with a board and do other major harm. Afterward, they looked through her bag and discovered some of the stolen items. She was scared and said she would pay for the damage, but Paula and Kelly were mad and did not understand why she did that. They forced Lydia back into the car and drove her away from her home, even though she admitted to stealing some things and promised to pay in full. Lydia's grandmother witnessed everything and sadly that was the final time she saw her grandchild. The family had not heard anything about her since then. When Lydia's mother, Maria Vivian, heard about it, she called Itzel and asked her to explain what had happened. On social media, she also found pictures of her daughter's friends. She printed them out and showed them to Andrea. Andrea knew right away which girls had taken her niece. Having all of this knowledge, Lydia's mother went to the prosecutor's office and made a report in which she blamed Paula, Arandi, Kelly, and Alina for her daughter going missing. On July 2, 2020, someone discovered a completely burned body in an empty lot in the El Barrio neighborhood of Kuliakin. There was so much damage to the body parts that it was not possible to identify the person. From the first looks, it was also hard to tell if it was a man or a woman. With all the proof gathered at the scene, the prosecutor's office opened a murder case against someone who has not been named. Around the same time, people were trying to find Lydia and figure out how she died. 
Police got DNA samples from Lydia's family to compare with other DNA samples we had. Everyone was hoping she would be found living, but as the investigation went on genetic testing moved forward. At a preliminary meeting on July 12, 2020, the three people who were being held were charged with Lydia's violent disappearance. There were orders for their pre-trial imprisonment. Investigators also got geolocation information from the suspect's phones to figure out where they went after taking Lydia. According to the information, Paula, Kelly, and Alina, who were still on the run, went together from July 1st afternoon to July 2nd morning. According to the reports, they went to Gamuchil, Chile, and El Salvador Alvarado before going back to Culiacan. People did not want to hear the news that the cops were still looking for the missing girl. DNA tests showed that the burned remains found on July 2 belonged to Lydia and de Beltran. The news that Lydia had died in such a horrible attack broke the hearts of her family and friends. The people who beat Lydia badly then covered her in a flammable liquid and set her on fire. The case took an unexpected turn, and now the police had to figure out if the people who were charged with her disappearance were also involved in her death. A long questioning session led to Kelly admitting to the lawyer that she was only involved in Lydia's disappearance. Paula and Arandi went before a second judge named Juan Luz Bertrand. Their public defender, Maritza Manchata, asked that the charges against them for Lydia's disappearance be dropped because the prosecution could not prove how directly they were involved in the claimed crime. They were only proven to have been there when Paula and Kelly took Lydia from her home. After hearing what the defense had to say, the judge chose to free Paula. It was possible to arrest her again if new proof came in because he told her not to leave the city. The state defender Hugo Irati Robles, who was Elena's lawyer, asked that the charges linked to Lydia's disappearance be dropped because the body had already been found and that new charges be brought. The judge did not agree with his reasons, though, and put her in pre-trial detention until the investigation was over. At the same time, Lydia's family thanked everyone who helped look for her on social media. In addition, they said that the people who killed her were in police custody. After a few days of identifying the body and starting the process of holding the accused criminals responsible, police kept looking for the missing girl. Once more, cops searched places to find evidence that could help solve the case. The family also decided to give blood samples for comparative DNA analysis so that the burned body found could be identified. Still, Lydia's family and friends were all still hopeful that she would be found safe. People who knew the victim and protested with signs and green shirts marched from the Cathedral of Culiacan to the office of the state prosecutor of Sinaloa. People marched while shouting slogans that said the crime should be solved and the criminal should go to jail. People at the protest raised their voices and said that Lydia had been taken alive and that they needed her to be living. A lot of people at the protest wanted the case to be solved and wanted an end to the brutal kidnappings and killings of women. Up until May 2020, the executive secretary of the National Public Security System said that there had been six cases of women being killed on purpose in the state of Sinaloa. Also, 13 reviews into femicides were done from January to June of the same year. The Mexican Criminal Code says that killing a woman is a crime. The hearing took place behind closed doors on July 22, 2020, and reporters were not allowed to be there. The special prosecutor for violence against women and vulnerable groups, Marlon Medina Lopez, told Judge Caxiola Rivera that Paula and Arandi were both involved in Lydia's kidnapping and death. But Arandi lost this advantage when new evidence was brought against her. A few days earlier, she had been freed because there was not enough proof of her direct involvement. There were also charges against Kelly and Paula's sister Alina, who was still on the run. The media said that the case against the suspects did not move forward even though months had passed. More than a year after the crime, Paula and Arandi were still in jail in Culiacan, Sinaloa. There were also rumors that Alina was still on the run. Nevertheless, some reports said Kelly was not really a child and that her parents had lied to keep her from being tried as an adult. The people who cared about Lydia kept asking for justice on social media by posting notes with pictures of the suspects. They also regularly held protests, asking for punishment and a quick investigation that would lead to Alina's arrest. On June 25, 2022, a sentencing hearing occurred at the regional offices of the Criminal Accusation System URL Centro. 
Judiciary Grislow Perez found Paula and Arandi guilty of murdering a woman, but not guilty of private person vanishing. The judge went over what had happened and the proof that went along with finding the person guilty. At the same time, she said that three guys were clearly involved in the incident, but no one knew who they were. According to the judge, Kelly was a minor at the time of the event, so she set a new hearing for June 30th of the same year to give her sentence. She received a three-year prison term. Alina, on the other hand, was still on the run because she was wanted for the murder of a woman and her part in the case. Additionally, it came out that Alina had let the suspects use her home to question and severely beat the victim. In a press release on July 1, 2022, the State Prosecutor's Office of Sinaloa said that Paula Nareed Metten had been given 50 years in jail for being the main person responsible for her death. In the same sentence, Randy Meneers got 24 years, 9 months, and 1 day in jail for killing Lydia. Also, each girl had to pay about 440 Mexican pesos in reparations, which was just over $20,000 at the time. The punishments gave Lydia's family members happy, but it was clear that it did not make them feel better. They'd also hoped that the truth about the three men who are said to have been involved in the crime will be found in the end. Thank you for joining us on this intriguing journey through a cold case. If you enjoyed this investigation and want to see more unsolved mysteries unravel, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Your support helps us bring these stories to light. Stay tuned for more thrilling cold cases and true crime mysteries.